who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Christmases have come and gone. And uh, over the years, we've put up decorations and opened a slew of gifts and listened to all kinds of music and we have uh, maybe heard a few readings from the Gospel of Luke. And while we may have experienced many Christmases, um, we may actually have missed part of Christmas. And while we have maybe seen many Christmas programs, many Christmas pageants, we've even heard parts of the Christmas story, we may have missed some of the background, some of the events, the meaning of why Christ was born. Here at American Fork Presbyterian Church on Sundays during Advent leading up to Christmas, we have been hearing sermons um, that uh, have talked about the Old Testament backdrop to Jesus and how he came and was the fulfillment of everything in the Old Testament. We've heard about the role of the Holy Spirit in Christmas and how important that was. We have heard how the angels are not commercialized little darlings that we are given, but that they are mighty messengers of God who do his bidding. And we've heard of the radical trust of Joseph, Jesus' earthly father, and the role that he played as the earthly father of Jesus. Yeah, there's much in Christmas that many, many people have not noticed or thought about. They missed it. Another part of Christmas is fear. Fear, you say? I thought Christmas was about peace and hope and joy and love. Yeah, it is. But that first Christmas, the one that the people of the Lord celebrate, there was some fear. When Gabriel is sent from God to tell Zechariah that he and his wife Elizabeth are going to have a son who will be John the Baptist and who will prepare the way for Jesus, Gabriel has to tell Zechariah, do not be afraid. When Gabriel goes to Mary to announce that she uh, will give birth to the Son of God, he tells her, do not be afraid. Rightly so. She's pregnant. She's unmarried. She hasn't been with a man. She's poor. When an angel goes to Joseph and he tells Joseph, 
do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife. He's told this because Joseph knows the woman he is to marry is pregnant, and it's not by him. And when an angel of the Lord appears to those shepherds, and the glory of the Lord shines around them, the angel said, Do not be afraid. After Jesus is born, King, Hendri King Herod goes on a killing spree of infants in Bethlehem, and Jesus, Joseph was afraid for his child, who wouldn't be. And when Joseph brought the family back to Israel after Herod's death, he heard that the new king, Archelaus, was just as bad as his father, and it says he was afraid to go to Judea. So he took the family to Galilee, and that's where Jesus was raised. In some ways, Jesus being raised in Nazareth was a result of fear. Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. It's a lot of fear in what we call the Christmas story. Yes, Christmas is about the birth of a child. But it's also a story about world rulers who get upset and go on rampages and common people who get caught up in circumstances and power and taxes and people who have to flee and they become refugees and senseless mass killings and deep hope for better things to come. Any of that sound familiar? I think the Christmas story gives us permission to be afraid. God knows this about us and our existence, that we get afraid. Zechariah, Mary, Joseph, the shepherds, they weren't the first ones in the Bible to be afraid. Listen to this list of people who, in the Bible who were also told, do not be afraid. Abraham, Hagar, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, the entire nation of Israel, Joshua, Elijah, King Jehoshaphat, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, the women at the tomb, Paul, the apostle, John. That's just to name some. So if you feel you're afraid at times, you're in some pretty good company. I read, I don't know, I didn't have time to count it this week, I was busy shopping, but I read that Do Not Be Afraid shows up 365 times in the Bible. That's one for each day of the year, if it's true. Whenever God or an angel speaks those words, it isn't a rebuke. God is not telling the person they should not be afraid and what's wrong with you. God says it because fear is real. Rather, the words do not be afraid are really spoken as a kind of encouragement. It's said more out of compassion, like a loving parent who would hold a, a, a scared child on his or her lap. The Lord said, do not be afraid to people in the Bible because he knew they were afraid. It is as if to say, I know what you feel. Be calm. Things are going to be okay. It may get hairy, but there is more going on than you see. God is up to something. Do not be afraid. It's often a flag waved for the person to watch for the Lord that God wants to do something in that person's life. God was on the move. He was going to bring deliverance or maybe a blessing or make something happen now. For Mary, he was bearing the Son of God. For Joseph, it would be uh, God protecting his family in a horrendous time. For the shepherds, it was a message of good news, that, of joy that they needed to receive and then they needed to share. Do not be afraid is often spoken in the Bible as a way to say, God is present. God is at work in what looks very terrifying. When Israel was to go up against its enemies and they were told, do not be afraid because the Lord your God who brought you up out of Egypt will be with you. 
as Mary waited for the, excuse me, as Abraham waited for that promised child with his wife Sarah and wrestled with God's timing, he was told, do not be afraid, Abraham, because I am your shield, your very great reward. When God calls Jeremiah to be a prophet and tells him, hey, it's not going to be easy, but he says, do not be afraid for I am with you and I will rescue you. When the women go to the tomb and find the body gone, they are told, do not be afraid, for I know that you're looking for Jesus who was crucified. They were in the right place. They were doing the right thing. They needed to know that God was doing something beyond their imagining. When the Apostle Paul got fearful and was preaching in Corinth, the sin city of his day, God said to him, do not be afraid. Keep on speaking. Do not be silent, for I am with you, and no one's going to attack you or harm you, because I have many people in this city. You know, often when someone in the Bible is told, do not be afraid, it's followed by that reassurance of God's presence, and that is the truth of Christmas, that God is with us. Jesus is Emmanuel. Emmanuel means God with us. The presence of another person can often make all the difference in the world when we are afraid. It can be of great comfort. It can be of great help. We read Psalm 23 when someone dies, don't we? Doesn't it say in Psalm 23, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will not fear, for you are with me. Are we going to live by that affirmation in our lives? That God is with us even in the face of the shadow of death. I wonder how much of our fear comes from thinking God is absent. Someone came up with an acronym for fear. F is for false, E is for evidence, a is for appearing, R is for real. Fear is false evidence appearing real. False evidence appearing real. And sometimes we get afraid because our imaginations run wild and we get a little irrational and we anticipate all kinds of problems and we just assume that the worst is coming down even though things aren't even there. Here's a story about a salesman whose car broke down on a country road on one dark and rainy night. He was kind of in the middle of nowhere. And he got a flat tire. Got out in the rain, opened his trunk. No lug wrench. Well, there was a light from a farmhouse that was uh, down the road, and he set out on foot through the driving rain. Surely that farmer would have a lug wrench that he could borrow. Of course, it was late at night. The farmer would be asleep in his warm, dry bed. Maybe he wouldn't even answer the door. And the, and, and the salesman thought to himself, you know, even if he did, he'd be angry at being awakened in the middle of the night. Well, the salesman kind of blindly went through the dark, stumbled on by now his shoes, his clothes, they were just soaked. Even if the farmer did answer, he began to think, you know, he'd probably say something like, What's the big idea of you waking me up at this hour? And that thought made the salesman angry. I mean, what right did the farmer have to refuse him the use of his lug wrench? After all, he's stranded in the middle of nowhere. He's soaked to the skin. Boy, that farmer's a selfish clod, no doubt about that. The salesman finally reached the house bang loudly on the door, a light went on, a window went up above the door, a voice cried out, who is it? The salesman yelled, you know darn well who it is, he was so angry, it is me and you can keep your blasted lug wrench because I wouldn't use it if it was the last one in the world. And being afraid can make us a bit irrational. We begin to think things that aren't even there. I've spoken before of a, a man named Tomas Halleck. He was, a, he was a Catholic priest in communist Czechoslovakia when the Iron Curtain was still up. 
church had to be underground at that time because of the communists. His mother didn't even know he was a priest. It was so secret. And there were many reasons to be a Christian leader and to be afraid in the days of the Soviet Union. And one day someone came and told Tomas Halleck that a fellow priest had been found dead and that they suspected it was probably the KGB that had been responsible. And the friend asked Halleck, aren't you scared? And Halleck admitted he was. But Tomas Halleck said it was his conviction that it's not a matter of not being afraid but of not allowing fear to govern us and determine our behavior. He said we must never let fear take the helm of our lives. And he said that we have to confront the experience of fear um, and, and being able to see our fear, we need to also be able to see that God is greater than our fear. And that is the key. And being able to see how big and God, uh, how big and great God is, his magnificence, his power, it can, it can neutralize how we think about what makes us afraid. I think Mary had a massive view of God. And when she sang, my soul magnifies the Lord. She knew how great God was. She could see that greatness and she could serve him despite her fears. What's making you afraid right now? Is it some health concerns? Maybe family problems? Job insecurity? Financial stress? Losing independence? social breakdown. Uncertainty makes us afraid. We fear the unknown. What's going to happen? When is it going to happen? How will it happen? What discomfort awaits me? I'll bet Zechariah and Mary and Joseph and those shepherds thought all about this. Henry Nouwen, the late Christian devotional writer, said, but when I trust deeply that today God is truly with me and he holds me safe in a divine embrace, Guiding every one of my steps, I can let go of my anxious need to know what tomorrow will look like or what will happen next month or even the next year. I can fully be where I am and pay attention to the many signs of God's love within me and around me. You know, despite what the advertisements and the cards tell us, Christmas is not a time to make everything in life perfect. Maybe Christmas is a good reminder that life isn't perfect. It wasn't perfect in Bethlehem. Like Mary and Joseph and others in the Christmas events, we find life is complicated and there's conflicts and there's uncertainties and things that cause us anxieties. But Christmas is a time to remember that God is with us in all of that. God doesn't separate himself from our messy, fear-filled lives. He doesn't say, well, you know, you get your life together and then you give me a call. And he doesn't wait to see whether we're going to be good or whether we're going to be bad. He comes to us because he loves us. Christmas is a time of peace. Jesus said to his disciples before he died, peace, I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give you as the world gives, so do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. There it is. Again, do not be afraid. I give you my peace. It's not the peace you find in a book or through meditation, or through therapy, or medicine, or a nice vacation. It is a peace that belongs to me, and you will receive it by trusting me, looking to me, and living with me. So peace on earth, goodwill toward all? Absolutely. But also, do not be afraid. Because life can be scary. But then there's the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, and he holds life and death in his hands, and he holds us in his hands, and God is with us, and that's what we find in Jesus. God is working, and whatever comes, we can trust in his love. Will you pray with me? 
Lord, in all our fears, help us to hear your words. Do not be afraid. Thank you that you know us. Thank you that you know each person in this room tonight. And that you come to us in our weakness, in our fear, enable us to come to you, the God who is with us. Amen.